in large parts of the United States now, and in elsewhere in North, so actually everywhere, never mind where we're talking about. But I believe now in Holland, for example, a majority of the population actually identifies as unbeliever, as people who put their reliance upon science and reason and humanism. Well, they don't need any further reinforcement. No one converted them, right? Nobody proselytized them. They don't have to go to regular gatherings to reinforce their beliefs in case they fall away from them. They don't need a priesthood. They don't need any terror or, uh, what is the word, coercion either. They just, we, I mean to say, we just are. And that occurs in human life just as naturally as the instinct to worship, to trust, to follow the leader, to be a slave. And it always has. And there have been some moments of great flourishing of it, as in 5th century Athens, and, um, and I would say at Philadelphia. Um, and they'll come again. But we know how fragile they are, but everything is fragile, isn't it? But I think we, we can claim, I wouldn't want to call it moral superiority. Yes, I would, actually, in a way. I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, this would not be true for me, but it would be true of many atheists that they don't want, they don't like the idea that the end of life means that they, they're dead. They would wish it to be otherwise, as many people do. Uh, many people think it would be nice to have a second life or an afterlife, so that at least an atheist can't be accused of going for wishful thinking. Uh, nor do we seek to force our beliefs on others. And we don't, we don't proselytize. So I think uh, we, can, we can live with ourselves in a way that is just as innate in human history and just as creditable as the claims, the unbelievable claims of supernatural knowledge and authority that are made by fellow mammals. Let's take uh, one more question right here. By all means. Yeah. Have we met before today? I thought so, yes. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say that the, this gentleman, um, you keep hearing about Southern hospitality. I got lost on the road here and turned into St. Andrews thinking I'd um, establish my bearings and asked the directors of this gentleman and said he was happy to give them as long as I would sign his copy of my Henry Kissinger book. I thought, it's true about Southern hospitality. <laughs> I must stop more people as I get lost in Tennessee. <laughs> well, I, I, I said earlier that I'm, I mean, I don't want to make this into a seminar about oneself, but I said earlier that I might be born without whatever it is you need to have. Uh, perhaps it's a gene. I know it's not a gene, but let's call it the metaphor for, for religion. I just, as a, a lot of people I know, um, and potentially I think everybody, I, I never gave it any... Um, credit, and actually it was the argument from design, I'm referring to this lady again now, that in a way sort of did it for me. Um, I must have been about eight, maybe nine, and it was Mrs. Watts's class on Bible study. I liked Bible study, I still do. Uh, that's why I had such a good time reviewing the Gibson film. Um, and she said... Isn't it good, children, that God made the world in this lovely way that's so ideal for us and for our... And, and made it so beautiful. She said, for example, all the vegetation, all the trees and, and all the grass, they're, they're green, which is just the right color for our eyes. Our eyes like green. Imagine if, they were, if it was blue or purple, how horrible that would be. And I thought, I wouldn't have known how to say argument from design at that point or pathetic fallacy either, or all kinds of things. But I thought, I thought that's bullshit. 
I didn't know anything about Darwin. I knew nothing about the evolution of the human eye. I thought, no, that's obviously the wrong way round, isn't it? But, uh, but around me, no one seemed to be stirring. I thought, okay, I'll file that, you know, for now. I was a vindictive eight, nine-year-old. Well, I've never heard a case for religion made better than by Mrs. Watts since. So I'm quite glad that she stated the essential problem with creationism so perfectly for me at that age. She spared me a lot of trouble. I've never heard... I've since then debated with Bishop Montefiore, the leading intellectual of the Church of England, and all kinds of other characters. I've, no one has come up to the standard of Mrs. Watts in stating what it is to believe. So, since then, if you really want, if you want my whole story, you don't want my life story with religion, um, I think. But that, that was it in a nutshell. I noticed also that uh, the, the less good schoolmasters and the less nice headmasters and the less intelligent people generally in school and society so when <coughs> up against it or when defeated by their own innumerable shortcomings would often take refuge in the idea of religion as a way of keeping order I mean just as a means of rule of trying to show who's boss but that was an easy thing to guess at too uh, the guy who holds the bible on Sunday is the guy who has he has authority as well as. And he doesn't want it spiritually, I promise you. He wants it right here, he needs it right now. And that was easy to see too. But that's the... I don't have the functionalist critique of religion. I don't think religion is a racket. I don't think it's just invented to fool people. Um, or, or to deceive or exploit them. It has often served that function, but that isn't the origin of it as a religion. Well, thank you very much.